Our next opportunistic fungal genus is Cryptococcus, uh, Cryptococcus neoformans and Cryptococcus gaudii. They are um, like spherical or they can be oval shaped. They have a capsule, so you can kind of see that in this mic micrograph down here, um, and they're yeast. Infection is usually acquired through inhalation. Again, sometimes associated with birds and bird droppings. Um, it can be associated with other outdoor environments. Cryptococcus neoformans, that particular species, is actually the most common cause of fungal meningitis. So we've talked about bacterial meningitis, we've talked about viral meningitis, we also have fungal meningitis. Um, and Cryptococcus neoformans is found worldwide. Cryptococcus gaudii has typically only been associated with tropical or subtropical regions. However, we are seeing the spread um, along the west coast of the U.S. up into Canada. So this is a fungal infection that we do have in the U.S. And weirdly enough, I always hate when I can bring my own life into this class. Uh, one of my cats has Cryptococcus gaudii. I mean, he's had it like for oh, a good couple of years now. I mean, he just can't seem to kick it. I give him... He's on an, uh, an oral azole, and he gets better, and then they tell me, okay, you can stop giving him the treatment, and I'm like, mm, you know I'm a medical microbiologist, right? Are you sure you want me to stop giving him the treatment? Yeah, stop giving him the treatment, and well, there's his fungal infection again. It's isolated to his, like, nose. It's in his, like, nose and sinuses, but he's got it. It was diagnosed, Cryptococcus gaudii. Um, but clearly it doesn't spread cat to person or even cat to cat uh, or cat to dog. None of my other pets have been infected. None of us in the house have been infected. But so we do have Cryptococcus gaudii uh, in Fresno. What we typically see in terms of presentation um, is that it will cause meningitis secondary to spread from the lungs. So the primary infection, again, is respiratory. Um, both of them, though, do like to go to the central nervous system. They are neurotropic. So that's why they commonly can cause meningitis. Uh, symptoms include fever, headache, altered vision and mental state, seizures. Again, your immune system is going to be um, what can predispose you to some of these more severe symptoms. If you have a healthy immune response, probably not. If you are immune compromised, it's far more likely. 10 to 15% of patients um, can experience skin lesions, ocular infections, or bony lesions. So here's a case study of cryptococcosis in a heart transplant recipient, 56 year old patient had heart transplant surgery three years earlier, presented with new onset cellulitis of the left leg and a mild headache that had been for the previous two weeks. Of course, um, the patient as a heart transplant recipient was on chronic immunosuppressive therapy um, and took, was admitted given IV antibiotics. Despite five days of treatment, the patient failed to improve. A skin biopsy of the area was obtained for histopathology and culture, which revealed the presence of Cryptococcus neoformans. A lumbar puncture was also performed. An examination of the CSF showed cloudy fluid um, and an elevated pressure in the CSF. Microscopic examination <clears throat> revealed encapsulated budding yeast. Cryptococcal antigen titers were highly elevated. Blood, CSF, and skin grew Cryptococcus neoformans. Systemic antifungal therapy with amphotericin B and flucytosine was initiated. So we're targeting the membrane and um, biomolecule biosynthesis. Unfortunately, the patient suffered progressive mental status decline despite aggressive management of intracranial pressure and maximizing doses of antifungals. He experienced slow progressive decline, leading to death 13 days after the initiation of antifungal therapy. CSF cultures obtained two days before his death remained positive for Cryptococcus neoformans. 
The patient in this case was highly immune compromised and presented with cellulitis and headache. Such presentation should arouse suspicion of an atypical pathogen such as Cryptococcus neoformans. Right? It's weird that you have a fungal infection, or it's weird that you have an infection in your leg and you have a headache. That's not normal. So that's what you want to look for. Given the high mortality associated with cryptococcal infection, a rapid and accurate diagnosis is important. Unfortunately, despite these efforts and use of aggressive therapy, many patients will succumb to the infection. So again, you've got to really look at the patient holistically. If a patient comes in with a leg infection, is it just a leg infection? Cryptococcosis can be diagnosed by culture or microscopy of the clinical material. Again, you're looking for encapsulated budding yeast. You can detect the can capsule antigen in serum or cerebral spinal fluid. Um, it can be diagnosed by PCR. Um, this again shows you the sensitivity of some of the tests. So again, antigen tests and culture are pretty good. Treatment is absolutely necessary right? Especially because it is neurotropic. It wants to go to the brain. And in our HIV AIDS patients, treatment is lifelong. Our next opportunistic fungal infection is aspergillus or aspergillosis. This again is a fungus that is typically found in the environment. Um, I have done I don't know how many times because I've been teaching forever um, in the lab where students will swab a surface in the lab, especially if it's a dusty surface, grow it on a plate and boom, aspergillus. It's everywhere. It's in the soil. It's in the air. It's in the dust. Like it's everywhere. In patients who are hypersensitive, um, you can have an allergic reaction. And in patients who are immunosuppressed, you can see destructive disease. So for the allergic reaction, it's allergy symptoms. For patients that are colonized, we'll see pictures of what that looks like. Um, you can have superficial cutaneous infections. You can have limited invasive infections and frankly, invasive pulmonary infection. Not super common, but it can happen. So they grow as molds. Um, they have septate hyphae and they have conidia when exposed to the air. So if you've ever grown anything in the lab and it looks like this, it's aspergillus. Like that's how I always know it's aspergillus. Um, and they grow tall, like they can push up on the lid of a plate. Super, super common in the environment, air, shower heads, water storage tanks, potted plants. This is why they don't allow you to bring in a real plant to the hospital. Like you cannot bring in a potted plant. You're going to kill somebody. We are constantly inhaling spores of aspergillus. I'm breathing right now. I'm inhaling aspergillus. Like, I have to be okay with that. I also am not immune compromised. So, you know, knock on wood. The respiratory tract is the most common route of entry. Um, and the outcome of infection depends on the host response. Like, almost everybody is going to be able to control this infection. Because you've never experienced aspergillosis, you can control the infection. When a patient is hospitalized, when a patient is immune compromised, that's when we worry about these opportunistic fungal infections. Most commonly, you're going to have that allergic response to it. Um, you can get symptoms of asthma. You can have pulmonary infiltration of those eosinophils, IgE, hypersensitivity. That's, again, most common. So patients are allergic to mold. This is probably one of them. But... Patients can have colonization of sinuses and lower airways. So you can have obstructive aspergillosis, um, and that's kind of seen here. When a patient has underlying pulmonary disease, cystic fibrosis, chronic bronchitis, you'll have plugs of hyphae um, and mucus. So you can kind of see that, like, oh, it's all nasty and gross. You can also get an aspergilloma to form. That's kind of shown here. They can form in the sinuses or in a preformed pulmonary cavity. Most patients don't have pulmonary cavities. What can cause a pulmonary cavity? And it's one of the systemic fungi, uh, tuberculosis, lung cancer, 
So somebody who's already got something, this can get in and cause a, it's a big fungal ball. Aspergilloma is a big ball of fungus. Usually, weirdly enough, asymptomatic, but can cause pulmonary hemorrhage. When a patient has aspergillosis, especially if they have the fungal ball, like the aspergilloma, or they have the plugs, you might have to remove that infected area um, or surgically remove the fungal ball. Disease can be superficial to disseminated and, and destructive. It really depends on the patient. Predisposition includes low neutrophil count, chemotherapy, steroid treatment, um, and once it gets into the bloodstream, it tends to go all over. And I've shown you this already. In hospitalized patients who develop an aspergillus infection, 85% of them die of aspergillus. So that's, that's bad. Okay, that's really, really bad. 95% of them die overall, um, but 85% of them die of, of that. Okay. To diagnose, this is tricky. Culture is tricky because the fungus is everywhere and is probably part of the normal respiratory mycobiome. So the patient might already be carrying aspergillus in their body anyway. So if you identify it from the respiratory tract, that's suspect. It should be there. So it's like, mm, you know, if a blood culture is positive, that's pretty indicative of a problem. Immunoassays allow for rapid diagnosis. Um, scientists are working on standardizing PCR tests. And of course, prevention is the best medicine. Filtered air for at-risk patients. Um, and with most of your patients, it's going to be a combination therapy of azoles and amphotericin B. Because we do see a lot of antifungal resistance in aspergillus. So <clears throat> I just told you, we see aspergillus uh, being resistant to antifungals. So the CDC does not have this as on their list of like urgent, serious, or, you know, critical threats, but they do include it in their brochure that we have azole resistant um, aspergillus infections. So this is not as common yet as some of the other, like, you know, antifungal resistant candida species, but the CDC is working on tracking them and seeing if this is one of those problems that might become something that they really need to look into more. So I thought this was a really interesting article. I included the link so that you can read it at your convenience. It's, um, it's popular science, so it's not like an actual journal article. It's like a newspaper article um, about the emergence of azole-resistant aspergillus in the Netherlands because tulip farmers use azoles to prevent fungal infections in the tulips. It's really interesting. So if you are a microbiology nerd like I am, you may find this article to be uh, an enjoyable read.